So this let's let's go this one with 4R XLA. He says, not a coincidence, Bochi has taken a last place team to the ALCS while Roberts is failing worse than Bobby Cox in the playoffs. Well, I do think Dodgers, Dodgers have to evaluate has this guy taken us as far as they can take us? Uh, there's no doubt that Bochi uh, is just a really good manager. He's a player's manager. He's an old school guy. He does obviously take take some of the analytics, but it's his dugout. It's his clubhouse. It's his team on the field. Now, I will say this. Chris Young, the ex-Padre pitcher who is an Ivy League guy, uh, he spent a lot of money in free agency. I mean, the amount of money they gave Corey Seager, what they did in free agency uh, to get Jacob deGrom, what they did when they made the trade to get Max Scherzer. I mean, they built this thing to win. They got Nathan Evaldi uh, from Boston. I think the most amazing thing is Texas has had so many pitching injuries, and yet they're there. Yeah, you know, They're going to the American League Championship Series against the enemy in the Battle of the Lone Star State. So Bochy Bochy's is an old-school baseball guy. He just knows the biz. Yeah, I mean, he's a special guy, <laughs> definitely a Hall of Famer. But then, yeah, the Dodgers had their share of serious pitching injuries, and they've circled on the drain here. So th this is remarkable to me. Um, but, you know, Dave Roberts, he makes you wonder, are, is he going to get forced out? Because there are, their fans in L.A. have been frustrated with Dave Roberts for many years, and this might be the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's not an isolated incident. That's no. the thing. This is the fourth or fifth postseason where there have been question marks raised about what were you thinking? Why did you do this? How come you could not handle this the situation better? Next question. Okay. Moving on down here. Let's get to Sergio. And he says, uh, Walter Alston won four rings in 23 years. Well, sort of two rings in 20 years. The failure was due to the lineup. I don't think Roberts goes anywhere. Well, you may be true because they gave Dave Roberts a contract extension and the players have to produce on the field. And this side of the table was not going to boo Clayton Kershaw because he got lit up. That side of the table <laughs> did. Yeah, uh, I thought it was grossly unfair. Dodger fans booing Clayton Kershaw, 210 career wins. It's going to the Baseball Hall of Fame. But at the end of the day, the players have to produce. And in a short series, they did not. And that's, to, that, to me, is really a shocker because I did not think that Arizona had anywhere near enough pitching once you got beyond Zach Gallon. Mm -hmm. And yet the three... D back starters we're dealing. You know, my wife, she'll sometimes go, the Diamondbacks? The Diamondbacks are going to the LCS. I mean, the Padres are better than the Diamondbacks. Well, no, they aren't, but they it, they they should be. Um, yeah, this this whole thing is unbelievable. But just think about next year. The Dodgers are gonna have so much pitching with all those injured, you know, veterans coming back, all the kids. I mean, they're gonna be in a great spot. But usually there's always some scapegoat, right? There's always someone that kind of pays the price. Yes. And is it Roberts? Is it Andrew Friedman? Are they going to let go of certain players? I mean, who knows? And is Kershaw done? <laughs> well, Kershaw will have a tough decision to make. Uh, he made $30 million this season, but he continued to pitch well. He's 13 and five with a 2.46 ERA. So he can still bring it. Mm -hmm. Now, is he a front of the rotation guy? Maybe he's not. But my goodness, they, they get all those injured pitchers back who are close to being back on the mound this year. And by the way, we have not touched the other hot button topic. Another day we'll do this. Otani and Dodger Blue. That's very much a possibility. Yeah. I mean, imagine him with all that pitching. I mean, Otani can hit the ball. and He's not going to go dark in the playoffs like Mookie and Freddie. So that's where we are there. Let's see what else you got here. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go here to the... Uh, SG Sports Talk channel. He says, my NLCS prediction is Phillies versus Diamondbacks, and my World Series position prediction is Rangers versus Diamondbacks. Oh, Sports Talk, I think you're reaching. You're going to hurt your shoulder doing that. that that's, that's a big reach there. Uh, Texas has got so many bats. Philadelphia's got so many bats, and Philadelphia's got frontline pitching. That's really, really good. So I, I think we're looking at a Philadelphia-Texas World Series. But you can't rule out Houston because the Astros sure got a lot of bats. Oh, yeah. Now, the Astros have been living on a little bit of borrowed time because I don't think their pitching staff is real. Starting staff is really deep, but they do bang it too. So I think I, the battle Lone Star State, I think it's going to be a fun series. Oh, I agree. And then that Jordan Alvarez, that guy is just crushes the ball. He's incredible. Um, but, you know, yeah, you look at the Diamondbacks, could they make it all the way? I mean, that would be something. I mean, to see them get that far. I mean, there's so many young kids on that team. They're going to be good for a while. 
that Corbin Carroll is a really great athlete. It was Christian Walker. Those guys started hitting home runs. They said, well, they do it in flurries and then it disappears, goes away from them. But, you know, the Diamondbacks did get to the World Series. They did win it mm -hmm. way back when. And that's when the ownership paid volumes of money to get the Randy Johnsons of the world and mm -hmm. Luis Gonzalez's of the world. And that was a veteran driven team. This is a really young team. But again, you're going to Philadelphia and you want to play the Phillies and <laughs> Bryce Harper and the boys, they come to play every minute of every night. So Arizona might wake up and realize, my goodness, where are we? <laughs> yeah, We might be in a lot of trouble here because Philly can bang it and Philly's got pitchers. They'll throw it. So on we, we go. Next question. On we go. Okay. Let's go here to Christopher. And he says, Washington will win in the battle against Oregon. Uh, could be. Uh, Oregon's got more sexy players, more dynamic players, more name players, more five-star players. But Michael Penix just makes so many things happen offensively, run and throw and moving the pocket. I just think he's very, very tough to defend. This will be a great game. And uh, I'm, I, I think we talked last week. I was just sick in my heart watching games last week and thinking this is the end of the Pac-12. This is a great farewell tour. This is the year of the quarterback. I said that the first week of September as the season was starting, and it's really panned out. I mean, from, from Oregon to Oregon State, Washington to Washington State, the Trojans, the Bruins, and what's going on in Boulder with Neon Dion and that coaching staff and getting those kids ready to play, and they, they play really hard. This has this been a fascinating Pac-12 season so far, but I kind of ache. It's the last time we're ever going to see this. Yeah, it's sad. And it's all blowing up in our face when it, this should be a glory time for the Pac-12. But it is interesting that Washington is is back, you know. And they're, when were the days when, remember, they won national championships? Were that in the 90s? Don Dreams. Yeah. So it's, it's been a while yeah. since we've seen Washington at the highest level. I mean, could you imagine in the final year of the Pac-12 having two Pac-12 teams in the college playoff? Oh, I think it very well could happen. Now, it's weird because the Pac-12 championship game might involve Oregon-Washington in a rematch. Interesting. Yeah, because there's no more divisions. It's one lump sum group of teams together, and one plays two in the championship game up in Vegas. So keep keep that in mind. We might get a rematch here before we ever get to the college football playoffs. On we go. On we go. Here, let's get John in. And John says, uh, worst nightmare for Preller, Snell and Hader both signed with the Dodgers. Well, the only question is you got the Otani issue also. And yeah, I don't think the Dodgers are going to go to a $400 million payroll. You know, Dodger payroll is pretty doggone significant right now. Now, if Kershaw retires, that's $31 million, I believe, that comes off the books that you can use towards somebody but i don't i don't think those guys are going to wind up at dodger stadium uh i hear st louis is going to make a run uh to try to sign three free agent pitchers because the cardinals seem to think they have a good young everyday team they just need arms and i hear they're going to make a run at blake snell and if st louis is willing to meet scott boris's dollar figure then maybe blake snell winds up there rather than somewhere else but uh I don't think the Dodgers are going to go. Both of them, I, would they make a run at Otani and one Padre? Maybe. But again, the payroll, you know, you don't want to go busting over that luxury tax by a large volume of money. The Mets are out there, you know, and the Mets divested themselves of big money with Verlander and Scherzer. So the Mets, they got space in that checking account to dive back into free agency. I don't know how Snell would do in the glaring spotlight that is New York media. That'd be fascinating to see. But if, Anybody's going to overpay. It's probably Mets owner Steve Cohen. And yeah, that's November 1st. That's Scott Boros calling Steve Cohen at City Field in New York. Well, I, you know, we talked about all the veteran players coming back from injury with the Dodgers, the pitchers, all the young kids. You wonder, is there any room, you know, for a hater or a Snell on the Dodger roster? There's, you know, people always speculate that Snell is going to go back home to Seattle and sign with the Mariners. I mean, what do you could, think of that? Could well be. Now, does Seattle want to pay $30 million or $25 million for a pitcher? Jerry DePoto is a very active general manager, but five-year contract, $25 million per season for a pitcher who's had surgery once already? I don't know that I'd go five. I'd, I'd go three. I might go state-of-the-art money. Hell, if you're going to go state-of-the-art money, keep him in San Diego. Give him three years at $25 million, just get him back in the rotation. But 
Uh, I don't think Boris is going to get five years from anybody for any pitcher, period, exclamation point. Okay, a couple more here, and then we want to do social media too. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's get Franco in. This is a quick one. He says, great hearing yeah. you at 3 p.m., just like the old 690 days. You are right. We are bleeping brilliant. And I, hey, you guys on live stream, you owe me. You need to tell all your friends what we're doing on this podcast every Monday, every Thursday. And you need to check my website too. End of my sales pitch. But hey, Franco, thanks for being with us. Okay, let's let's uh, get some social media people here involved. There's some good ones in here. Um, this is from uh, Jay Nuanez talking about the Dodgers, and he says, "Same old hacksaw, wrong as always." I love how the Dodgers choke in the playoffs every year. Yet if the Padres won ten out of eleven division titles and a half ring to show for it, you'd be trash talking them as always. They are not the successful organization you are trying to make them out to be. Now is he referencing Dodger Blue or is he talking about Bad Baseball Brown and Fool's Gold Padres? <laughs> I think he's talking about Blue. Oh, hey Dodgers, have great records in season, postseason. Saddled by an awful lot of disappointments, but all you need to do is look at the fact they draw 4 million fans. They have a history and a legacy and a consistency that goes back a long, long way. So I'm, I'm impressed with the Dodgers. I think they're a classy organization and the Padres, this current ownership is the best we've probably ever had since the days of maybe John Moore's Larry Lucchino saving baseball for San Diego, like Ray Kroc saved baseball for San Diego back then, but there's been no, no consistency in terms of being able to win. Hey, I'm entitled to my own opinion. You're entitled to disagree, but I'm a talk show host. You don't want to argue with me. <laughs> well, Dave Roberts, you ever think that maybe he overthinks it? He maybe outsmarts himself with the decision-making in the playoffs? That's, uh, that's an ideal question. Uh, I don't know if you, if you asked him, you'd ever get an honest answer. Um, but there's just been so many, faux pas with pitchers postseason. <laughs> I mean, if it were an isolated one-time thing, okay. But the fact it's it's kind of impacted five times in the postseason. Who you started, who you asked to go into the bullpen between starts, your overuse of the bullpen, yanking guys early versus leaving Lance in, Lynn in to give up four bombs and six batters. I mean, it's just way too many breakdowns for me. Yeah, unbelievable. I mean, lots of people here are commenting on the Dodgers. Here's one from Bitter Actor. He says, <laughs> name a team that has devalued the 100-win season more than the Dodgers. Dave Roberts is a quality manager, but his hatred or incompetence with his pitching roster is absolutely criminal. I think that the thing that stuns me is because analytics are very much part of the makeup of the Dodger baseball operation. So I don't think he's not doing these decisions in a vacuum. There's all kinds of input in their staff meetings of structure of who's going to throw when and when who's the first one out of the pen and how long do you go? So this is not strictly on Dave Roberts watch. Cause I think there's, there's the Freedmans and all the analytics people of the world that have input as to, we think you should consider this. So it, that I, sounds like the, what we've been hearing about with Preller in yeah. the dugout, you know, and his analytics guys trying to tell, you know, Melvin what to do. Let's get a few more in here. Uh, how about a James Harden comment? This is from John. He says, Harden is not the guy to help you get to the playoffs. He doesn't find roles, and he likes his vacations and clubbing too much. <laughs> Trade for a number one pick? No go for me here. Well, the Clippers are trying to find a third team that would be part of the equation to make the deal. Uh, Philadelphia is asking for a Clipper number one pick. They're asking for one of their guards. Uh, Terrence Mann, they were asking for a flip-flop of future number one picks where they would they would get the higher pick from the Clippers. And they're trying to get a, a first-round pick and a couple of expiring contracts from another team to be a complex deal. Clippers are trying to find it. Evidently, the Clippers believe that Harden would put them over the top because they got the big two and they got Russell Westbrook, who had a big bounce-back season. But, man... I think the dynamics of your offense really changed because James Harden has to have the ball in his hands all the time. All the time, yeah. Yeah, so how does that equate with Kawhi and with Paul George? And then how do you mix and match him with Westbrook as first guy off the bench? So we'll see, but, I mean, NBA people that I network with are telling me these talks a bit started up this past week, and they, they think by opening night something's going to happen, which, wow. 
Well, uh, it would work. James Harden in, in the Clipper uniform would work if we see Paul George and Kawhi Leonard on the bench, you know, injured again, yeah. uh, which we don't want to see that, obviously. So he's going to have to accept a different role. But, you know, that kind of step back three that he has is, is like untouchable. But do you think he travels on that? And there's been a, some criticism of it. You think anybody travels in the NBA? Oh, yeah. Hell no. yes. <laughs> Stupid question. <laughs> All right, let's do one more here. Okay, let's uh, let's get a Padre comment here. And uh, this is from El Elna. And she says, try to sign Soto before the season starts. If Boris wants too much, keep Soto until the trade deadline. Let go of Hader and Grisham. I suspect Snell will have a down year after he's paid. And then, quote, I've watched your sports show as a child, Hacksaw. I'm glad to see you online. Well, thanks for coming along for the ride on this as we've gone into new technology here. Uh, on our live stream on my YouTube channel. Uh, Padres, tough call. Uh, based on the dollar situation that we keep hearing that this payroll is coming down to 200 mil, I would not give Soto <coughs> a contract extension right now. Do it again. Prove yourself again. See if you can lead us again. And see if the rest of these guys come along and all have bounce back seasons. But if they're going to pair this from 253 down to 200 million, there's going to be guys are going to have to vacate uh, this roster. And I, I would assume that would be both Hader and probably Blake Snell. My biggest concern is because you got you got those two name pitchers who, <coughs> who are walk free agents. You got three starters back end of the rotation all have pricey options. And now you're going to overpay to keep Waka. You're going to overpay to keep Martinez. And if, if, if the answer to those is no, then where are the arms coming from? I hate to say this, but we could get by to the winter baseball meetings in December, John, and we could have half a roster here. I mean, if guys leave and how are you going to replace those guys if your payroll is coming down? So they're painted into a real tough corner with what they have and what they've given the Xanders and the Machados and Soto and Tatis and to a degree Cronenworth. They're in a real tough corner because they've committed significant money to those guys. And now, now you're going to have to, face the reality that maybe this year was the only year they had a legitimate chance to do it. Cause I don't think you can go get stars to join these stars at affordable prices. I don't think guys are going to come here at discounts just to play with Manny and Soto and El Nino. Well, if you go from 253 to 200 million a year, Soto has to be one of the guys you're going to trade because you, you can't trade um, Machado or Bogarts or Tatis with those, you know, locked in long-term deals. Soto will be dealt if they have to get down to 200. But I think this is just proving, you know, this whole strategy of buying top talent, you know, it, that's okay if you've got like two or three guys, you know, including pitchers that you buy. But the, the bulk of your roster has to be coming up through your farm program. And I think that's where Preller made a mistake in not letting some of those guys in the farm system develop. I mean, we could have had, you know, C.J. Abrams. We could have had a lot of guys that would have been able to produce more than some of these veterans. Did. At affordable prices. And at affordable prices. I yes. agree with you. Hey, listen, we.